everybody. It, it's it's great to be back on the campus uh, and to uh, see the new buildings and, and so forth. Uh, so this project officially started uh, with Henry and myself a, a year and a half ago, uh, but I like to think it started with a about fifteen years ago uh, with a very ill-conceived wager on my part. And I, I started, I moved to New Hampshire in 1999, so it was right before the, the New Hampshire primary took place. And that was an exciting uh, cycle, because you had Bill Bradley challenging Al Gore for the Democratic nomination, but they had John McCain challenging George Bush for the nomination. And as you might remember, McCain defeated Bush in New Hampshire resoundingly. And so Henry and I have been emailing, we had known each other for about 20 years by then, 22 maybe, and um, but we have been emailing back and forth about uh, primary politics and demographics and so forth. And I thought I knew something, which is always a dangerous place to be when you think you know something. And so after New Hampshire, I said, proclaimed to Henry that I thought McCain was going to make a, a long run in this and that he would win South Carolina and win the nomination. And Henry politely had, uh, said, no, that wouldn't happen. And I, I forget which one of us said, do you want to make something of it? But we did. And uh, about five, six months later, we were sitting in the bleachers at Fenway Park, courtesy of myself, because I had lost my bet <laughs> to my friend Henry, and co-author, Henry Olson. Uh, but that kind of started... Yeah, it was a good game. It was, um, and that kind of started for, uh, for us, kind of a long-running conversation with, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of emails over the various cycles that we've seen in presidential nomination politics. Uh, and... About a year and a half ago, Henry published an article in the National, in National Interest, the National Interest uh, called the title of the book, The Four Faces of the Republican Party. And I read the article and uh, thought this would be good uh, uh, if we extended it into a book. And so I proposed it to Henry, and he accepted. And we've been working for the last 18 months on what you're about to see. So what we do in this book uh, is to challenge the conventional wisdom on uh, the Republican Party's nomination process. And the conventional wisdom typically goes something like this. Uh, there's an establishment candidate. Pick your establishment candidate. Could be George Bush, could be Jeb Bush, uh, could be George Herbert Walker Bush. But the establishment candidate tends to be more moderate. And the question the media asks is how far will that candidate be pulled to the right before he becomes the nominee? And will that candidate be pulled too far right to remain a viable candidate in the general election? Right. And then there's an insurgent. Right. This year, we're calling them out, the media's calling them outsiders, but it's the same idea. It's typically someone who's more conservative than the establishment candidate. And we ask questions, uh, and the media asks questions such as, well, you know, will that candidate get the favor of the Tea Party? Is this 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 cycle, it's, is this the year of the outsider? Uh, and so it's, an, as Henry put it nicely in his original article that got the whole ball rolling, it's a neat story, uh, and it's exactly wrong. And so we set out in this book to try to, to set up uh, a more nuanced and accurate depiction of the Republican presidential primary electorate as it is, not as the national media uh, thinks it to be. And we had a few puzzles that we thought we had to explain uh, in this book, which was, one, why does the so-called conservative party rarely nominate the most conservative candidate? Right? Think back in recent history to Mitt Romney, uh, John McCain, right? even George W. Bush. None of those cases, Bob Dole, none of those cases did the party nominate the most conservative candidate. Second, why does the Republican Party often <coughs> nominate the candidate who's apparently next in line? And that's been another kind of common media narrative, that the, the, part, the Republican Party is always orderly, right, where it's the Democrats who are disordered. Well, if you've been watching for this year, we know how false that whole story has turned out to be, that the Republican Party is in any way orderly, at least not the way that we typically think of it. And then third, why do certain types of candidates repeatedly surprise observers of Republican nomination contests. And then 
the media proclaims, well, it's different this time, and we're going to make the case that it's, no, it's written, it may be a little different, but it's not all that different than what we've seen in previous cycles. I'm not going to get deep into the literature review here. Uh, that's in the back half of chapter one for those who are interested, but basically there are two schools of thought on the nomination process in the political science literature. One school of thought is that the entire nomination process is driven by elites, and that Iowa and New Hampshire are, for all that we celebrate them, uh, are really no more than confirmations of what elites have already decided. And by elites, we might mean elected elites, you know, senators in the Republican Party, governors, we mean money donors, and so forth. Uh, and so, but the elite-driven theory of nomination process is that What's going on now, the so-called invisible primary, before actual primaries and caucuses take place, that's what matters. And what matters is elites coordinating around a candidate who is, one, conceivably, plausibly electable in a general election, but two, can satisfy the intense policy demanders, to use a term from one of the more famous books on this topic, The Party Decides, being reasonably satisfactory to all the intense party policy demanders in the Republican Party. The other school of thought centers around not the invisible primary, but around what happens next February in Iowa and New Hampshire. Iowa and New Hampshire, according to this theory, puts uh, grants one candidate, typically momentum, okay? and the big mo is George Herbert Walker Bush. Okay, and the idea here is that early wins in Iowa and New Hampshire generate media coverage. Media coverage generates increased donations. Uh, all of that leads to more victories in later contests. So that the idea is that there's a very early tipping point in all of this. And early, early contests set the uh, stage for later contests. We think both have something to uh, contribute. But both neglect the fact that the Republican Party is made up of factions. In other words, political parties, Republicans as well as Democrats, are comprised of groups that are unlike each other in very significant ways. And we often talk about partisan politics these days being tribal and polarized and so forth. Well, we can think of the Republican Party as a, as a confederacy of tribes. Okay? The Confederacy has a common dislike. They know who their opponent is. They, you know, All the tribes of the Republican Party dislike Hillary Clinton more than they dislike one another. But during the nomination process, their dislike for Hillary Clinton doesn't erase the differences, if not outright suspicions, amongst themselves. Okay? They're, you know, uh, in Iowa, evangelical spouse who liked Mike Huckabee and uh, likes to go to Branson on vacation doesn't have much to say to a Wall Street 40-year-old financier uh, who likes to read Ayn Rand and espouses libertarian politics and has a secret admiration for Ted Cruz. They don't have much to say to each other. There are differences in social economic class. There are differences in ideology. Okay. There are differences, perhaps, in the positions on issues that they want their nominee to take, you know, whether they want them to be more pro-life or pro-choice, to be more uh, for a greater tax cut or a lesser tax cut. But as we'll argue, issue positions often closely resemble one another in the Republican Party. And even after several debates, it's still difficult to distinguish you know, Marco Rubio's tax cut proposal from Jeb Bush's and so forth. But where we think it really makes a difference in terms of issues in, is in terms of priorities. If you listen to a 10-minute speech from a candidate in New Hampshire at a town hall meeting, uh, scarce amount of time, what two or three issues is that candidate going to emphasize before taking questions from some cranky New England? Well, their priorities make, priorities make a difference. Okay. And then last but not least, voters' values. Okay. We typically think of the Republican Party as the religious party. 
and the Democrats as the secular party. But as we'll point out, that is also uh, less nuanced than it ought to be when we're trying to come up with a portrait of the Republican Party. So essentially, there's a, a two-stage challenge for candidates, we would argue. And part of it involves momentum. But to put a finer point on it, what a win in Iowa or a win in New Hampshire buys you, the media calls it momentum. Some political scientists call it momentum. But what it really is, is the ability to reach a national audience of voters who are similar to the voters who just cast votes for you in Iowa and New Hampshire. So when John McCain wins New Hampshire in 2000 with the help of moderate and liberal Republicans, liberal and moderate Republicans nationwide realize they have a chance. And liberal and moderate voters congregate to someone who's viable for the nomination, but also who thinks like them. Okay. So that's the first part, is you have to champion your faction. You have to win your bracket. I'm still recovering from last March. That's the last time I'm going to say the word bracket. Um, the second stage, it still hurts, does it? Okay. The second stage is to build your coalition. Okay. To build your coalition. That once the champions of the brackets have emerged, the champions of the factions, then you have to reach out to other parts of your party in order to win the nomination. And what we're going to show is how certain factions are more amenable to compromise with others. Because once we get past Iowa and New Hampshire, the field winnows dramatically. And so a lot of voters in later states that vote, say, on March 1, 2016, as opposed to February 9, 2016, are faced with second best choices, if they're fortunate, if not third best choices. So here are the four factions of the Republican Party. One, moderate and even liberal Republican voters. Two, somewhat conservative Republican voters, uh, who are the, the unsung heroes of this entire story. The no one, no media, ever go out and look for the somewhat conservative voters. Okay? But they are there, they're there in droves, and they're very important. And then on the other side, we have, of course, you know, very conservative evangelicals, and then also very conservative secular voters. So people with not a religion that's not central to their life, but they're nevertheless, they hold very conservative positions on issues. The data we used for this uh, comes from exit polls, uh, those things you hear about for an hour or two after when the returns are coming in, and maybe there's some analysis the day after, and then they disappear. Well, those data sets go somewhere. And fortunately for us, they were all collected by the Roper Center, Public Opinion Research. So we were able to take a look at the original data sets, about several dozen exit polls altogether over three cycles, dating back to 2000. Um, they cover collectively about 33 states, okay, so we're talking about, you know, so we, we've got data on 28 of the first 35 contests on the 2016 nomination calendar, so a nice, nice coverage there, and it also, exit polls, uh, we have data on tens of thousands of Republican primary voters, okay, and there are ups and downs to uh, exit polls that we can talk about in the uh, Q&A, if you like, but one of the nice things is that it, there's a you can break down the electorate then into different factions the way that we wanted to do. Okay. First up, moderate and liberal Republican voters. And here you'll see uh, four graphs which are broken down by region. And this simply shows what percentage of the Republican primary electorate self-identified as either moderates or liberals. And yes, there are a lot more moderates than there are liberals, but they are still there. And one thing that might strike you, as it struck us uh, in looking at the data, was, gee, there are more of those voters than we might have thought. Certainly in the Northeast, you know, typically four out of ten voters in a primary will self-identify as moderates or liberals. And one might expect that in the Northeast, but if you look over to the Midwest, we're seeing 30 to 40 percent, uh, except for Iowa and its caucuses, of course, but the others holding primaries, 30 to 40 percent, moderates or liberals. 
in the South, okay, the heart of the Republican Party, the heart of modern American conservatism, we find three out of ten voters self-identifying as moderates or liberals. Okay. Because we had uh, access to data on tens of thousands of voters, we were able to kind of put together a collective profile of those voters. Okay. Uh, and we do this for each of the four factions. Uh, and their party identification, now we're not talking about party registration here, but just simply if they were self-identified Republicans who on their exit polls heading out of the ballot box. The one thing that this uh, tells us is most of the early races, uh, the states do not have partisan registration in early races. That, that's true for independents as well. So party registration is not the defining factor. They're open primaries in the political process. So that's why parties are usually at the early registration stage. About six out of 10 voters in this faction actually describe themselves as Republicans. Okay, so some ambivalence there. No real ambivalence toward the Tea Party. 32% okay. said they su uh, support the Tea Party. So two-thirds of moderates and liberals do say they don't support the Tea Party. Religion is a marginal factor in their lives. They go to church much less frequently than uh, somewhat conservative or very con certainly much less than very conservative evangelicals. Okay. On abortion, majority favors legalizing abortion. They tend to focus more on the economy as opposed to controlling budget deficits. And in terms of candidate qualities, moderate and liberal voters like a candidate who says what he believes. And uh, a consistent question in different cycles on the exit polls is, what candidate quality matters most to you? And again and again, we see moderates and liberals saying, we like someone who's independent. We like someone who says what he believes. They, these voters put much more emphasis on experience as opposed to saying, I want someone who's a true conservative or I want someone who shares my values. Moderate and liberal voters are indifferent to that. On the right, of course, is John Huntsman, uh, who in 2012 demonstrated uh, the difficulties that one can have when one paints oneself into a corner and describes oneself as a moderate or liberal Republican voter and then does makes a hash of that. Now, moderates in 2000, 2008, and 2012 found a champion. And so uh, what I want to point out here with the, this, this is a look at all of the states that, for which we have exit polls in 2008. And it's a little difficult to see, but there's a black bar and there's a white bar right under it. And this is John McCain's performance in 2008 among this faction of voters, moderates, and and what you notice that even in Iowa and New Hampshire, the first ones, he does far better among moderates and liberals, again, that's the black bar, than he does among all voters in those states. That's the, the white bar underneath. And what happens after Iowa and New Hampshire is moderates find their champions. And so the, the distance or the length, those black bars get longer compared to their overall, uh, McCain's overall so what happens? Moderates and liberals, he, McCain gets momentum of sorts. That is, national audience of moderate and liberal Republican voters say, okay, I can pick McCain, I can pick George Bush, or I can pick this fellow Alan Keyes. McCain is the moderate and liberal of those three. So in essence, the winnowing process in Iowa and New Hampshire makes it easier for voters in other states to identify with a candidate who is, whereas when there's 10, 12 candidates, they're much more difficult to identify. Our next group, again, the unsung heroes, uh, are somewhat conservative voters. Okay. And again, what you'll notice here is the same uh, format in terms of we break it down by state and by region. And what's interesting in, that we found in this was that how similar all of the bars are. And that you saw in the first graph, set of graphs of regional differentiation. But here it's a much more muted, that somewhat conservatives just kind of blend in. But they represent healthy segments of the electorate all across the different regions of the United States. 
credit Henry with this, not with the picture. That was my smart alecky idea. But, um, but when uh, all year, one of the things that I grappled with when Henry and I would talk back and forth or email back and forth, this is actually the first time we've been in the same room together since we started this book. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it would have been worse. <laughs> well, when we hear my intro message. <laughs> but one of the things that puzzled me all the way through was who are these somewhat conservative voters and how do we describe them? And what Henry came up with as a identifier was, was former Speaker John Boehner. Right? Somewhat conservative Republicans are, one, strong Republicans. Right? Their party ID is stronger than moderates and liberals. They tend to be generally supportive of Tea Partiers, right? but not as supportive as some, as we'll see. On religion, they're somewhat dutiful. Right? They haven't, you know, a good number of them would describe religion as central to their lives, unlike moderates and liberals. On abortion, they take the sensible median position in their party. That is, they're not for legalization, but they're not for prohibition. They are in favor of serious restrictions. On issue after issue after issue, in which they said, in which exit pollsters ask, which issue is most important in your vote in this primary? Somewhat conservatives fall in the middle. Not as, you know, more so than moderates and liberals, less so than very conservative voters. And it happens again and again. And the quality that they prize most in a presidential candidate might well be described in the same way that we would describe John Boehner. Right? Reliable. Right? Reliable. Not an ideologue. Not a flashy conservative. Not a Ted Cruz. But reliably, consistently, chamber of commerce Republican. These are the voters who hold the balance of power again and again and again in Republican primary cycles. These are the deciders. Mitt Romney in 2012 right, defeats Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum thanks to his performance among somewhat conservative Republicans. And again, we see the gap between uh, the black bar and the white bar where Romney overperforms among these somewhat conservative voters. So Romney is able to put together in 2012 a faction of moderate Republicans and, because that's not enough, as John McCain found out in 2000, somewhat conservative Republicans. Here are the very conservative evangelicals about whom we talk so much. And notice the great differences in regional uh, variations here just in terms of their presence in the election. Again, these are evangelicals who self-identify not as conservative, but as very conservative, not as some, just somewhat conservative. Okay. In the Northeast, they are basically one out of ten voters, if that. Okay. Uh, in the Midwest, they approach one out of five voters, except for the Iowa caucuses, of course, where they represent one out of three voters. And that's very conservative evangelicals. Okay. They're most prominent, as you might have guessed, in the South. They have some presence in the West, though they, that more resembles the Northeast. Okay. They are the brethren of the Republican Party. Right. Uh, they, are, they have very strong party identification. About six out of seven identify as Republicans. They are firm allies of the Tea Party movement in the Republican Party. They are, as you would guess, devoted to their religion. They go to church frequently. Okay. On abortion, they're not uh, content with the median position of the somewhat conservatives, so they want an outright prohibition on abortion. Okay? The issues that matter to them most are social issues, as you would guess. So not only do they take a position that's very conservative on abortion, but they say when they're asked what issue is the highest priority, the highest priority, pick one issue, what's your highest priority? They're more likely to say abortion than any of the other factions we're talking about. Okay? Abortion is our number one issue. That's the issue we want our nominees to address. In terms of candidate qualities, they're most likely to say, we want a true conservative as our nominee, okay? and we want someone who shares my values. Okay? So this, we're on the opposite pole now from where we were with moderates and liberals, who are very happy with maverick independent, think-for-themselves candidates. They want someone who thinks like them and who shares the same values. Mike Huckabee in 2008 uh, went to the, the Values Voters Summit. Mitt Romney went to the Values 
voter summit. And remember Mitt Romney, moderate from Massachusetts, geared up in 2008 and assumed all the right positions that he calculated in three ring binder consulting fashion would appeal to very conservative evangelicals. And Mike Huckabee walked onto the stage and he said this, he said, I come here not as one who comes to you, I come here as one who comes from you. And that was that. Right? So as you see, Mike Huckabee did, did far better among evangel very conservative evangelicals, far better, by far, far outweighs the white bar than he did among the electorate. But notice, even at the end, when it was clear that he was doomed to lose the nomination to John McCain, very conservative evangelicals stuck with their man. Bill upset at press conferences joking that he thought Carolina was going to marry his sister that was going to win because he thought that possibly the best place for McCain and the Delta Biden was right and actually the Supreme Chief was in the part Huckabee won that one. You look at that chart and you see that Huckabee does about as well among evangelicals in South Carolina as he did in Iowa, even though he had lost the race in Michigan in between, even though he had lost New Hampshire in between. He loses South Carolina then loses Florida very badly, but he's got no momentum. He goes to the South, and suddenly in one of his states, very conservative evangelicals, he's back to where he was in South Carolina and Iowa. He's got his momentum with the instantaneous communication of his message about the entire district. The theory of momentum you just described, Bob, is completely false, but there's no data for it. And when we, we don't show it here, but when we ran a multiple logistic regression of Huckabee vote, it's clear that even after you control for demographic factors, and you have to control for ideology, the fact that the fact that a, a voter is born again remains a significant factor in whether they decide to vote for Huckabee or not. Last but not least, this is the group the DC media talk about the most, and ironically, but not surprisingly, it's the group that matters the least. <laughs> These are very conservative secular voters. Why do the DC media talk about them so much? Because you can't roll, you can't walk down the street with walking into a think tank with no offense, um, who is a very conservative secular voter. So one, of course, you know, journalists go with what they know, and they assume that there's lots of people like that because they're here in this, you know, urbane setting, and that's where they tend to be. You know, we tend to find these voters that are well educated. They like to live in cities, they like the finer things, they're not interested in living in rural America and so forth. They're, uh, you know, typically they represent about one out of ten, one out of eight voters, uh, with a couple, you know, Nevada's, the Nevada caucuses are a clear exception to that rule. But they're a small part of the party, although they, but they appear to be more influential. Steve Forbes, remember him? 1996 and 2000, very conservative secular voter. Party ID, very strong Republicans, okay? also very enthusiastic about in their support of the Tea Party. Religion is, as you would guess, given the title, marginal to their lives. Okay? On abortion, there are four restrictions on abortion. However, it's far from a top priority for them. Okay? They're much more concerned with issues such as uh, budget deficits, illegal immigration. Their candidate qualities, the qualities that they that matter most to them, they Looks familiar, right? Looks just like very conservative evangelicals. We want a true conservative, they said. We want someone who shares my values, they said. However, the difference, and this is the problem that the devil's very conservative voters and their leaders in the Republican nomination process, is that while very conservative evangelicals and seculars both agree they want a true conservative, they can't agree on what that is. They both want someone who shares their values, but those two groups on the far right don't share values enough in common because of the religious secular divide. So what happens is that very conservative seculars, after all the fanfare about the latest candidate, whether it's uh, Steve Forbes or whoever it might be, wind up settling after Iowa and New Hampshire when that candidate, their favorite, inevitably flames out, uh, they settle for second best. They settled for, they wanted Steve Forbes in 2000, but then after Forbes fizzles, they settled for second best. They went with George Bush over John McCain. 2008, 
they when they wanted Mitt Romney, but when Mike Huckabee persisted and essentially dr helped to drive him out of the race, they were confronted with John McCain versus Mike Huckabee, a very conservative evangelical versus a, a moderate, somewhat conservative candidate. Very conservative seculars fled to John McCain reluctantly, but they did not want Mike Huckabee. Uh, 2012, you see the same thing again with with Romney, Santorum, and Dinkins. Okay. So what have we learned from these cycles? And I'm going to turn things over to Henry to talk about 2016. Uh, one, religion divides the religious party. Religion divides the religious party. And that there for every Iowa and New Hampshire vote first, Iowa Republicans and New Hampshire Republicans are from separate tribes. And they have they this they Dislike may be too strong a word, but they're certainly mutually suspicious of one another. They cohabit in the same party. They'll vote for the same candidate in the general election, but they have very different views on who the candidate should be. Okay. Second, moderates and liberals in the conservative party have unexpected leverage. Okay. Again, uh, McCain in 08, Romney in 12, the favorite of moderates becomes the nominee in part because moderates unite early, thanks in large part to the placement of New Hampshire, okay, which is full of moderate Republican voters. So that signal goes out loud and clear, this is the candidate. That's why Chris Christie, when I talk to my mother, and she lives in New Jersey, says, God, he's always up there with you. He's never down here with us. There's, there's a reason for that. Third, very conservative, the reason why, another reason moderates have leverage is because very conservative voters can't agree for the reasons I and last but not least, somewhat conservative voters who are relatively anonymous nonetheless determine the nominee. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Henry to talk about 2016. Thank you, Dante. Um, actually, that 2000 race um, was where I began to notice the things in the exit polls that led to the publication of the article 14 years later, is that... Um, uh, I started to look deeply at the exit polls and noticed a somewhat conservative variant that you could explain every state that McCain or Bush won on the basis of that. And then 2008, I quietly watched, and that was true again. In 2012, again, so it was time to write about it. So uh, our bets actually led very directly to uh, uh, that. Uh, so I, uh, I, I'm thanking you now, and maybe I'll even take you to a ball game. But in uh, befitting our uh, mutual fascination with baseball, Dante gave me the uh, job of answering the question that you care most about, which is, who's on first? <laughs> so um, the thing to understand is under our theory, um, a friend of mine, uh, or actually my boss, uh, who's also a friend, uh, says that basically what we're doing is applying game theory to the Republican primary electorate, which is to say, you take a look at the choices before you, not your ideal choices. In the early states where there are more candidates, uh, candidates, uh, voters are really casting more of a values vote as far as who their first choice is. But once it becomes clear who's viable or not, they start to take a lie behind people who they find second best. So the early states are the bracket winning states, they're the winning winning states. So looking at the electorate is extremely important. As noted, the, you cannot win Iowa from the right today without being the plurality favorite of the very conservative evangelical. You want to know why Ted Cruz started his career in 2013 as the Tea Party firebrand in the last few years can't help but mention God in every third sentence that he, uh, that he utters? It's because he knows that he has no chance unless he combines the very conservative evangelical with the very conservative secular and displaces somebody like Mike Huckabee or Bobby Jindal from the leadership of that faction. New Hampshire is uh, the moderate mansion. It's where the moderates have the chance to win. Uh, it's where uh, why John Kasich is advertising early in New Hampshire and nowhere else. It's why Chris Christie, who seems to lack money but doesn't lack time, is in New Hampshire all the time. It's why John Huntsman camped out there because if your lane to getting national attention is by moderates, you have to win New Hampshire. South Carolina then becomes the place where the somewhat conservatives really dominate. That the uh, very conservative evangelicals and the moderates kind of balance one another out 
and invariably the somewhat conservative choices that win South Carolina, despite its reputation as an evangelical bastion. And then Nevada caucuses don't get a whole lot of play. I think they will this time. One reason they haven't gotten a whole lot of play in the last few races is because Mormons are 25% of the electorate, so that it was, Mitt Romney was winning 88% of the Mormon votes, so he pretty much had the caucuses locked. Um, without that, it actually is the bastion of the soft libertarian, fiscal, secular conservative. So this would be the place that if Rand Paul is going to come back from the dead, he's going to do it in Nevada. This is the place where if Ted Cruz wants to score a win after maybe getting second or third in a couple of places, he's going to do it here. Uh, I think Nevada is going to be more important. Then we move on. We have After these races, we should have down probably four, maybe five candidates, uh, depending on exactly how the races turn out. And um, this very conservative faction, particularly the evangelicals, have decided to cluster together in what is being called the SEC for South, uh, it's going over, I don't have to explain what SEC means, uh, the SEC primary. Um, that's a good thing if you're a believer in momentum theory, because look at how many very conservative states are voting on March 1st. Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia. Some of these are more conservative than others, uh, but clearly, uh, with the exception of Vermont and Massachusetts, which will give whoever the moderate choice is a notable, uh, some notable victories on March 1st. Um, that candidate who is the favorite of the very conservative evangelical wing is going to get a lot of victories on March 1st. So why doesn't that really determine things? Well, one, momentum is not correct. Uh, you only get momentum within your faction. So if a candidate wins on the basis of a message that is primarily appealing to the one, to the very conservative evangelical wing, or perhaps, as with Ted Cruz, also to the very conservative secular wing, all that does is communicate your message nationwide, and two-thirds of the Republican Party is going to left out. You can take a look at that by looking at the most recent Quinnipiac national poll with Ted Cruz, who's consciously, he will tell everybody in Washington that he's going to combine the Tea Party, the Libertarian, and the Evangelical wings of the conservative movement into one. Basically, he's got a variant on our theory, but he thinks it's a majority of the party. Quinnipiac does ask, its Republican uh, poll respondents about ideology, and unlike most pollsters, divides them into very conservative and somewhat conservative. So in the most recent national poll, Ted Cruz is first among very conservative voters with 26%. He's ahead of Ben Carson. He's ahead of Donald Trump. He leads among the very conservative voters. He's already getting to his goal, but he's only got 14 or 12% nationwide. Why is that? He only gets 7% among the somewhat conservatives, and he only gets 2% among the moderates. The winner of the March 1st primary, if it's the March 1st primaries uh, go to form, will only get a consolidation of two minority factions within the Republican Party, unless they also have a message that is appealing to the somewhat conservatives or the moderates. The other thing that hurts is that these, vote, these states, by the RNC rule, all have to award their delegates proportionally. So what does this mean? The winner here had better deliver a knockout blow because if there's an establishment candidate who has stronger support among somewhat conservatives and moderates left standing after March 1st, that candidate will get support from later voting states that are outside the window that award delegates on a winner-take-all basis. To put it another way, New Jersey votes on June 6th. It's dominated by moderates. It gives 51 delegates. Whoever wins that will get a 51 to 0 delegate lead. You have to win based on my calculation, four of the medium-sized states on March 1st as a very conservative candidate to make up that 51 delegate lead. The very conservatives have shot themselves in the foot. Late March, uh, Louisiana, Michigan, and Mississippi actually vote within the proportionality window, but again, with the exception of Michigan, which is a state that is uh, leaning towards the establishment or the left, um, Louisiana, Mississippi will simply add more Victories for the very conservative evangelical faction with very few delegate leads coming out of it. And then we get to March 15th. Florida, statewide winner-take-all. Illinois, congressional district winner-take-all. Ohio, statewide winner-take-all. Arizona, winner-take-all. Look at the factions. This is somewhat conservative country. This is not Ted Cruz country. This is whoever emerges as the somewhat conservative candidate. And this is where they will, within one week, 
eliminate the delegate lead of whoever the conservative candidate who sweeps the Deep South has. And then we get to the later races. This is moderate, uh, this is, uh, moderate country. By the end of April, Wisconsin votes on a largely winner-take-all basis. New York is a largely winner-take-all basis. They will have established a delegate lead by this point going into the races in May and June. And then we get to New Jersey, statewide winner-take-all. Utah, statewide winner-take-all. California, winner-take-all by 53 congressional districts, which, or which, because of the way California works, really empowers the moderates in a somewhat, uh, somewhat um, conservative coalition. So it's not going to be a statewide winner-take-all, but it's going to be a dramatic delegate boost for who's ever favored by the establishment. Uh, this is why I remain convinced that uh, the nominee is going to be, as it has been in the past, the person who is favored by the somewhat conservative voter. So let's look through the scenarios. Donald Trump. Does Donald Trump change this? Well, yes and no. He changes it in the sense that right now Donald Trump is unusually pulling from all of the factions. Most candidates, like Ted Cruz, tilt in one direction or another. Jeb Bush, highly tilted to the moderate side. Marco Rubio is like a bell curve where he keeps among somewhat conservative. Ted Cruz, highly tilting toward the very conservative side. Donald Trump pulls relatively evenly among the factions right now, but he's doing it on the basis of class. That the thing that biggest divider as to whether or not you're going to vote for Donald Trump is not your ideology, but whether you graduated from college. The group that hates Donald Trump the most in the Republican Party are Republicans with a postgraduate degree. So what do we know? We know from what we've done is that there are certain ideological predispositions to that. When you get below the first order vote, when pollsters ask, well, if it were a one on race, one race between Donald Trump and X, who would you vote for? Then the factions reassert themselves. And very conservative evangelical voters tend to be less likely to have graduated from college. They gravitate towards Donald Trump. Moderates and very conservative secular voters tend to have graduated from college, postgraduate degrees. They gravitate against Trump. The balance is that in a one-on-one -on -one battle, Trump would probably lose if the election were held today. And that's assuming that Trump doesn't start to decline a little bit as people take their votes a little more seriously. Outside of the Trump scenario, we have four scenarios. The least like scenario is what I and Dante call the moderate dream. And that is that Iowa nominates a very religious person like Mark Huckabee, and a pure moderate comes out uh, like Chris Christie. What's pretty clear is that between those choices, uh, the somewhat conservative voter uh, will not like either choice, but they'll probably stick with a moderate as opposed to a very conservative evangelical. However, all of these candidates are not polling very well right now. So this looks to be least, it is least likely that a pure moderate, as opposed to a somewhat conservative with moderate backing, will emerge from New Hampshire. And it seems less likely that a pure social conservative, as opposed to a social conservative with other backing, will emerge from Iowa. Movement conservative dream is kind of the reverse. That's where Ted Cruz unites everything and runs against somebody they perceive to be a moderate. In this case, we pick John Kasich, who is explicitly running a moderate campaign in New Hampshire. This is a little more likely, but it's while Cruz is doing better on his part, none of the moderate-only candidates seem to be putting together the sort of unified enthusiasm behind their campaign that propelled John McCain to a New Hampshire victory. Instead, you are seeing them cannibalize their own vote, that Bush and Kasich and Christie, to a lesser extent, are drawn roughly evenly among moderates, suggesting that they are not going to be as united behind the champion and produce a winner in New Hampshire, which makes this scenario much less likely. The traditional uh, scenario is the religious conservative versus the somewhat conservative. Um, in here, uh, we've got uh, Bush and Carson. Uh, in a sense, uh, Bush, it, it, this is a little inaccurate because Carson right now is doing better among somewhat conservatives than traditional religious conservatives, and Bush is just generally tanking across the board. But this scenario is basically a rerun of what we had in 1996 with Pat Buchanan against Dole, what we had in 2008 with uh, Huckabee uh, versus McCain, and what we had in 2012 with Santorum versus Romney. We know how this ends up, and the religious candidate loses. So then we have what looks like to be the most likely, which is that the very conservatives unite a little better this time, and somebody with appeal among both of the very conservative factions comes out of Iowa. That's essentially, right now, according to the polls, a battle between Carson and Cruz, kind of like Harry Potter. Both cannot live. One must die. 
and they'll have the Battle of Hogwarts in Des Moines. Um, one of them will come out. Marco Rubio is very consciously pushing to be the somewhat conservative candidate. And that means unusually that he can lose, perhaps, but finish second in Iowa and maybe have a narrow win in New Hampshire, but then propel himself down so that he's emerging as the person who is the best alternative to Cruz. And as I pointed out, all he has to do is survive through March 15th. He actually doesn't have to win very much. He can win Massachusetts. He can win Michigan. He can lose most of them. But as long as he's finishing second everywhere, he's denying Ted Cruz the delegate lead. Then the terrain shifts in his favor, and it very quickly becomes the march to the nomination for Marco Rubio. And with that, we'll take questions. Thank you.